Good afternoon, everyone. This is Ben Mandel, Northeast Regional Director with CalSTART. I want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon for a webinar overview to support the launch of the New York Truck Voucher Incentive Program. Uh, we had one successful session uh, that was very well attended last week and are pleased to do it again this week to support uh, maybe some of the same folks as, as joined us last week and hopefully others as well. Uh, we want to get the word out uh, widely about new program availability, uh, some changes that have been made, and more, more than anything, just the fact that funding is now again available after a hiatus of a bit more than a year in New York. Uh, and NYSERDA is pleased to uh, share with you some of those program details today. So for this session, uh, we've got 90 minutes allotted, and uh, as the discussion dictates, we, we do have the ability to, to stay on and address more questions as they come up. Uh, Patrick Bolton, who's a senior project manager at NYSERDA and their clean transportation group, is going to walk through the program background, um, some basic and, and some detailed elements of the voucher funding sources and the funding amounts that are currently available. At that point, uh, we know there are going to be a lot of interested questions on that topic. We'll take a, a brief pause for Q&A and see what questions come in. Uh, more on how to submit questions in a moment. After that Q&A block, we'll go into program eligibility guidelines. Uh, and we'll also be walking through the voucher process and mechanics, as well as the involved parties. So who all is involved in, in the process of getting voucher funding allocated. The Center for Sustainable Energy is on the line, and they are providing uh, the Voucher Help Center for this iteration of the program. Uh, so Jenea from, uh, <clears throat> Jenea from CSE is going to give an overview of what the Voucher Help Center is and how to contact them. And we have also got Susan McSherry on the line from New York City Department of Transportation. She's going to share uh, high-level information on a program that is soon to be announced the New York City Clean Trucks Program as a companion program to the statewide voucher program. Uh, to end, we'll have a block of time available for dis general discussion and questions. Make sure that any lingering questions are addressed here. Now, in terms of ground rules, uh, this webinar is being recorded, and we intend to post the slides uh, as well as the actual recorded webinar on the program website, which is linked here. So this is the shorthand URL that will be uh, used throughout the duration of this program. Uh, I highly encourage folks who are interested to, to go ahead and bookmark that URL for easy reference. We do want to hear from you, uh, so everyone for the, for the sake of simplicity is logged in in listen-only mode right now. We will uh, open it up at a few points in time during this session to field questions, and there are two ways you can actually raise questions for our attention. So one is going to be to type those questions into the question box that should be in your webinar control panel. Uh, alternately, you can click the raise hand button in your attendee uh, portal, and that'll indicate to us that you have a question that you would like to be unmuted to ask. And once we, um, once we address all or most of the written questions, we will then turn to the phones and see if we can unmute uh, those who have raised their hands and indicated that they want us to um, address different territory. With that out of the way, I'm going to turn it over to Patrick Bolton from NYSERDA. Great. Thank you very much, Ben. And thank you, everybody, for attending today. We're very excited to <clears throat> finally be able to launch this program and uh, start issuing vouchers and get some clean trucks and buses on the road in New York. Again, this is Patrick Bolton. I'm a senior project manager with NYSERDA in the Clean Transportation Group, and I will be acting as the program administrator uh, for NYSERDA on this effort. Uh, next slide. So just to give you know, kind of a brief overview of why New York State is interested in doing this and, and kind of what our goals are, I think it's no surprise to anybody that the vast majority of Class 3 to 8 trucks and buses that, um, that operate in New York are uh, operate on diesel fuel. And diesel emissions include carbon dioxide, particulate matter, nitrogen oxides, and carbon dioxide, um, which con contributes to climate change and particulate matter, uh, which also contain or and NOx can also harm human health. So New York State is committed to meeting multiple clean energy goals uh, for the state, including a 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 
And deploying these electric and alternative fuel trucks and buses can help meet our goals and reduce the negative effects of operating these trucks and buses on diesel fuel. Uh, and obviously continuing and expanding the truck voucher incentive program makes these deployment of alternative fuel trucks and buses more affordable and also easier for fleets in New York State. The next slide. So what is the truck voucher incentive program? Well, the truck voucher incentive provides point of sale discounts, what we call vouchers, to reduce the cost of all electric and alternative fuel commercial vehicles in New York State, both trucks and buses. What do we mean by point of sale discounts? In this program, NYSERDA provides the incentive to the entity that sells the truck or bus to a fleet in New York State. That incentive amount is taken off the sale price of the truck or bus. 100% of the incentive is reduced, uh, is used to reduce the sale price of the truck or bus to the fleet. And after the truck or bus is delivered, the fleet has paid the balance back to the, uh, the dealer that's selling the vehicle. NYSERDA then reimburses the dealer for uh, that incentive amount. Um, again, the program is looking to bring together both the vehicle manufacturers, the dealers, who we call contractors under our program, and fleets to get these cleaner trucks and buses on the road. And this program does include a scrappage requirement um, that requires you to re uh, scrap a, a diesel truck or bus with a model year 2009 or older diesel engine. And for every vehicle that you receive an incentive on, you must scrap an equivalent diesel truck or bus that has, again, a 2009 or older model year diesel engine. All right, next slide. A little bit about the first round of the program. So we commenced the program in 2013, and we our funding expired in 2018, mid-2018. But under that previous round of the program, we de, um, did approximately 600 trucks and buses, um, everything from electric vehicles, CNG, CNG conversions, hybrids, and hybrid electric conversions as well, working with approximately 60 fleets across the state, and with voucher funding of approximately $14.5 million. Uh, one of the new features of the program is that we will not be including diesel particulate filters. So the DPFs would not be eligible under the program going forward. Uh, next slide. Again, what are some of the highlights for this program this time around? Uh, NYSERDA is, is using multiple funding sources to fund the program. So we're taking funding both from uh, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation with their Volkswagen Settlement Funds and also taking money from or receiving money from New York State Department of Transportation utilizing their, their federal congestion mitigation and air quality funds. Uh, we're working to take both of these programs, both which come with their each come with uh, their own funding restrictions and melding them into one program that should be as seamless as possible to, the, to both the dealers and the fleets that are participating in the program. So I'm going to go through what the funding sources are and what some of those restrictions are, just to give you a detailed understanding of what some of the uh, restrictions that we're operating under. Uh, pro in the previous iteration of the program, we only used funding from New York State DOT and the congestion mitigation air quality uh, funding, which limited the amount of or the, the number of counties within the state that we could operate under. Under the current program, the Volkswagen funding is available statewide, while again, the funding we receive from New York State DOT is still only available in the 30 non-attainment uh, counties in New York State. And we'll show you a map and a list of those counties later. Again, diesel retrofits are not eligible, but propane is eligible under the current program. Uh, we will also now, going forward, have a scrappage requirement for almost all projects, uh, except for uh, buses that are used by uh, transit-type agencies or municipalities for operations that essentially serve the people. So if you're running a, a service that... Um, provide service for the elderly to get around town or you're providing paratransit or other types of services like that with shuttle buses. There are no scrappage requirements on those as long as they are located within one of those 30 non-attainment counties in New York. And we'll go through this in a little bit more detail as we go through. Um, go ahead, next slide. So who is the team that's operating the program? Again, uh, 
as myself, Patrick Bolton with NYSERDA. We also have a voucher help center uh, from the Center for, for Sustainable Energy. They could, they'll more or less act as a kind of a first line of uh, question and answer um, for the program. So if you have questions of, is my project eligible? Is a technology been approved for the program or a t particular kind of truck or bus been approved for the program? Um, and they will also be assisting with processing vouchers and processing um, you know, payment requests under the program. We also have CalStart will be our outreach lead and uh, providing technical support to the program. And for reporting and analysis, uh, we've also hired industrial economics that will be helping us with our fairly extensive reporting requirements that we have due again to the funding sources. So the funding sources want to know where their money went and what good did it do. We have to collect information from the fleets that operate these trucks and buses and report back that information to um, our, again, our funding sources, New York State DEC and New York State DOT. Uh, next slide. Okay, I'm going to go through a little bit about the voucher funding sources and amounts and again, what some of the restrictions and requirements there are on that funding. Next slide. Okay, so for our first <clears throat> um, iteration of the program, and let me just take a quick step back in, here and say that um, we have launched the program. The program is currently active. We are receiving and approving vehicle applications now. Um, we are onboarding contractors and dealers into the program so that they can apply for vouchers. So the program is active. These are a list of the, the two funding sources and amounts that we are opening the program with, so to speak. But we do intend to add additional funding to the program from various sources, including additional VW settlement funds for transit buses, school buses, and other specialty vehicles, um, as well as potentially adding some additional NYSERDA funding to the program to cover any uh, areas where the, the two funding sources that we're using for the program can't fund a specific kind of project that we still think is something that the state would like to see happen. So under the CMAC, again, from New York State DOT, we have $10 million available for class three to eight battery electric vehicles only, can be a truck or a bus, but strictly for battery electric vehicles. And again, the CMAC funding can only be used in specific, in 30 specific counties within the state of New York. Also to start from New York State DEC under the Volkswagen settlement, we have $3.6 million available for class eight heavy duty trucks and class four through seven medium duty trucks. We have $4.8 million. Eligible technologies under the VW settlement include battery electric, plug-in hybrid electric, conventional hybrid, uh, hybrid electric, non-plug-in, compressed natural gas, and propane are all eligible under the VW settlement program. And again, for the heavy duty trucks and medium duty trucks. And we are under discussion with New York State DEC to add additional funding for transit, uh, electric transit buses, and also specifically for school buses going forward. But those are still under negotiation, um, but we do intend to add those pots of funding, most likely by the end of the year. Uh, next slide. So there are some restrictions under the congestion mitigation air quality uh, program. Uh, the funding does originate from the federal level, from the Federal Highway Administration. Those funds go from the Federal Highway Administration to New York State DOT, and then from New York State DOT to NYSERDA. Uh, the CMAC program from Federal Highway includes what we call our, our Buy America requirements. Um, New York State, under this specific program, we do have a waiver in place to the Buy America requirements, but that waiver is only for battery electric trucks and buses, class three through eight, and final assembly must be um, performed in the United States. So if you are an electric school bus chassis manufacturer or an electric school bus manufacturer, you make your chassis in Canada, you can have it shipped to New York and put in battery packs or put in, you know, power control systems or other, you know, final assembly related items or even putting, you know, the box on the back of an electric truck would all count as final assembly in the United States. Um, or if you're even, you know, just manufacturing a, a, you know, a chassis, again, in Mexico or outside the United States, you have that chassis uh, delivered to the U.S. and you install 
you know, a, a garbage truck system on the back of the truck, that counts as final assembly. Um, and we can't go through that in detail on a case-by-case -case basis as we're onboarding vehicles into the program. It's not something you have to worry about. If the vehicle is approved under the program and it's listed, it meets all the necessary requirements for the program. And again, the funding is managed by New York State DOT, and <clears throat> the vehicles must be domiciled and operate in one of the 30 non-attainment or maintenance counties in New York State. And I think we have a map next that will show you what counties those are. Okay, so the counties in green are the 30 CMAC eligible counties. Again, the CMAC funding will go for strictly only battery electric, but it can be a truck or a bus, class three through eight. And this funding also does include not just new trucks, but it also includes uh, electric repowers. So under the CMAC program, you can repower a class three through eight diesel truck uh, into a full battery electric truck or bus under the program. So repowers are eligible as well under CMAC. Uh, next slide. Again, the second funding source is from New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. These are Volkswagen settlement funds from the Appendix D of the uh, Volkswagen Mitigation Trust. And this program is really intended to replace the oldest, dirtiest diesel engines that emit the greatest amount of nitrogen oxides uh, in New York State. So hence the very uh, pretty stringent um, scrappage requirements that we do have under the program. And again, DEC is working with NYSERDA to distribute these funds um, in New York State. DEC has a, a 10 item plan that they've submitted and had approved by the trust that shows how they intend to spend the money that they are getting from the trust, approximately $129 million in total DEC is receiving. And as they move forward and, and, and uh, develop plans of how they want to spend money within individual categories, they'll contract with those various uh, entities to spend the money. Uh, next slide. Okay, this will help explain it a little bit better. So this chart shows the 10 different items in uh, New York State DEC's uh, mitig action, mitig settlement mitigation plan. The current program that we've released includes funding from item one, the class eight local freight and uh, port drainage trucks. I know the funding says up to $11.5 million, but the, pro and the NYSERDA program was initially allocated 3.6 million. They are giving funding to other programs and other entities around the state as well, not just the truck voucher incentive program. We also currently have under contract and are operating and up and running for the class four through seven local freight trucks as well. And again, both of these items, item one and item six, include full battery electric, plug-in hybrids, conventional non-plug-in hybrids, compressed natural gas and propane. Uh, class four through eight trucks can be funded under item one and item six. NYSERDA is currently under uh, negotiation with New York State DEC to add uh, multiple fundings from item two. So we are negotiating final contracts to add funding to the program for school buses, shuttle buses, and transit buses that again would be available um, on a statewide basis, not just in the CMAC counties. So if you're in a county now that you're looking to do some, uh, you know, an electric bus, but um, you're not in one of the CMAC eligible counties, uh, don't worry because going forward, we're going to be adding more and more funding to the program that will be more expansive and include more counties around the state. And not just from item number two, we're looking at adding, you know, potentially some other uh, of, of these items as well to the program. All right, next slide. Okay, so here are the voucher funding amounts and caps. So under the VW settlement program, again, class four through eight trucks. Uh, if you look on the column on the left, the vehicle technology, battery electric vehicle, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, hybrid electric vehicle, CNG and propane. We will pay up to that max incremental cost of the percentage on there. So for BEVs, battery electric vehicles, it's up to 95% of the incremental cost up to the max incentive amount per weight class. So for, just as a random example, for a class six battery electric truck, 
the incentive mat would be 95% of the incremental cost and the upcharge for that uh, battery electric truck or, or truck and up to a maximum incentive amount of $125,000 again for the class six. So that hopefully that helps you understand and read the chart. Um, under the CMAC portion, again, it can be trucks and buses. The CMAC allows us to do class three, uh, which VW does not allow. VW only will do class four through class eight uh, vehicles. And CMAC will do all the way down to a class three. So under the CMAC funding for an electric, an only electric, battery electric truck or bus, class three through eight, you can get the incentive amount shown there. And under the CMAC, you can get up to the 80% of the incremental cost up to the cap per uh, GVWR uh, weight class of the truck or bus. And maybe linger on that just for a second to let everybody get a good look at the incentive amounts on there. Okay, um, next slide. So in fact, the next slide is, is our placeholder to pause for questions on the funding sources. So rather than put up that placeholder, why don't we keep this funding table slide up through that um, and we can, we can tee up a few of the questions that have come in. That sounds good. Okay, great. So the first question that came in um, is from Angela. And she's asking if we have a tentative timeline for when transit and school bus funding will become available. Uh, they're, they're, both of those contracts are under negotiation. My best guess is uh, hopefully by the end of the year or no later than January of next year. So sometime in the next few months, we should have those executed in the program avail and the funding available within the program. Okay, great. And then we have a question from Robert. Um, regarding Buy America. So final assembly requires a lot more detail than what you have described. Is there a form that must be completed or can the manufacturer simply provide a letter stating that final assembly is in New York or in the US rather? Yeah, the manufacturer can provide a letter detailing what exactly what work exactly is done in the United States. Um, if we have questions about whether or not that meets Buy America, we'll submit that to DOT and Federal Highway and just have them confirm. We do that as part of the vehicle onboarding process. So once you've done it as part of the process, you don't have to do it for every single voucher. Um, you only have to provide the information that first time up front and let us know, you know, what work is done, what's the value of the work that's done, and that can be done in just a letter. You can submit to us as part of the vehicle, again, the vehicle approval process. Okay, thanks, Patrick. And then we have a question that came in from Jason regarding scrappage requirements. Um, so he's asking if we're definitely required to scrap or if you can purchase outright. Uh, every project under the program is required to scrap even repowers. So in the case of a repower, you would just have to scrap the diesel engine. Um, obviously, if you're repowering, you're not going to scrap the chassis. The only cases where scrappage is not required is if a public entity or a transit entity, transit type entity, which could also be a could be a state um, authority like a like a CDTA or an NFTA, you know, a traditional transit agency, or a municipal, county, town, village entity that operates a service for the benefit of the public. And again, something along the lines of like a, you know a shuttle services for the elderly in their county or town, or um, you know, paratransit services, things like that, that are offered by a municipal kind of entity for the benefit of their, um, you know, town, county, whatever. In those cases, if you are, you can use CMAC funding um, to fund those electric buses, but, and you would not have to scrap, but any project under VW, if you want VW incentives, you have to scrap. There are no exceptions at all under that. And under the CMAC, the only exception, again, is, you know, a transit-related entity or a public entity that, that um, you know, provides some sort of a public benefit service for their municipality, county, whatever it is. Hopefully that helps explain it a little bit better. Thanks, Patrick. And Kendall is asking, as far as funding goes, are there any infrastructure incentives that will be tied to the vehicle vouchers? 
There aren't yet, but uh, there are um, infrastructure incentives that will be tied to the transit and school buses going forward. So most likely that'll take the form of some sort of a kicker. So let's use an example of you're going to buy an electric shuttle bus where for the sake of argument, we're going to pay 100% of the incremental cost, which is um, $100,000 for that electric shuttle bus. In addition to the incentive you get for the vehicle, you would get some sort of a flat kicker from our um, from the program as well. In, in other words, you would get an additional twenty twenty five thousand dollars that you can use on your own to install the 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 electric charging stations as part of the project. Um, and again, that strictly would be for the transit buses and for the school buses. Okay, great. And then Jason has another question about the eligibility of state university bus systems. Yeah, state universities are eligible under the program. Um, they would be uh, eligible currently under the current iteration of the program under the CMAC funding. So you would have to be located in one of the 30, again, CMAC eligible non-attainment counties in New York State. And it would only be eligible for battery electric buses and at the incentive levels that you see in the in the chart, the second chart below. Patrick, where would you categorize state university bus service within what you were describing earlier about the transit possibility of opting out of the scrappage requirement for the lower CMAC incentive levels? That wouldn't be considered transit. That would be considered a private operation. If it's used just to shuttle students around the universities, whether it's a public or private university, it would still have the scrappage requirement. Um, we're thinking more of, again, a transit service. It's a something a local municipality or the state or a state uh, authority or state agency would provide, again, for the benefit of the general public, not a, uh, a fixed population like a student body at a, at a university. Okay, and there's a few more questions about eligibility that I'm going to bundle together. Um, so, let's see, would yard trucks operating in municipal waste management be considered operating for public benefit? Uh, yard trucks are eligible under the program, but they're only eligible under the CMAC um, funding currently. Um, so they would have to be operating within one of the 30 non-attainment counties. And the yard hostler or the yard truck at the municipal facility would have to be, the new vehicle would have to be registered as an on-road vehicle. Uh, the vehicle that you're going to, you would scrap under that program can be an off-road vehicle. Again, as long as it has a diesel engine model year 2009 or older under this only and only under the yard hostler kind of uh, scenarios, um, can it be an off-road vehicle, a non-registered vehicle? Thank you. And under CMAC, is New York City included as one of the attainment counties for battery electric school buses? Um, ben, maybe can we go back to that slide? Yeah, so New York City is included in the program. Um, for the most part, the eligible counties under the CMAC are, tend to be the urban counties or the or could be a suburban county that's located right near an urban area or surrounding an urban area. Um, in addition to our program, we're going to hear a little bit later on in the presentation from New York City DOT about their updated program um, for trucks um, in New York City as well. So if if you are eligible for the New York City uh, funding program, we tend to ask you to go to them first for funding. If you are not eligible for the program and you're located in New York City, you can still come back to the NYSERDA program and either use uh, VW or CMAC funding for the project. And again, for the most part, you won't even know which funding um, amounts, or, or not the amounts, but you won't know which funding stream we're using to fund your individual vouchers. We may use a combination of both, or we may use just one or, or the other, depending upon where your project fits best. But for the most part, you won't know. You'll just know you're getting an incentive from the truck voucher incentive program and what the amount is. But for the most part, you don't need to know these things. It's just explaining on, a, on occasion if we have to say to you, 
well, we can't fund you, um, uh, we can't fund a specific project for some reason, or if we have to, um, you know, limit an incentive amount to some amount, these are the reasons why those things happen. But for the most part, you won't need to know that, uh, what funding source or stream that we're using. Okay, and then we have a question from Henry regarding um, the funding amounts. Can you explain the 90% of incremental cost calculation? If a plug-in hybrid or hybrid uh, truck costs $100,000, how much funding will they receive? Okay, so the incremental cost is based upon the difference in price between a diesel truck or bus and a and the alternative fuel, battery electric or whatever alternative fuel it is. In this case, you want to say a plug-in hybrid. So let's say a diesel bus costs $100,000. The plug-in hybrid costs $200,000. The incremental cost will be $100,000. And under this scenario, we would pay up to 90% of the incremental cost. So we would pay up to $90,000, but it depends on the vehicle size. So if the max incentive could be $90,000, but you're buying a class six vehicle, the incentive would be capped at 70,000. So you're really only gonna get 70% of the incremental cost on a class six but you could get the full $90,000 on the class seven or the class eight. Okay, well that, um, I think we're good on questions for now. We can move on to the next section. Thank you, Patrick, right. for answering all of that. Oh, I'm sorry, one more came in from Yusra. Can we combine VW and CMAC for, uh, for, for a voucher? If you have your own CMAC funding, in other words, you, you can uh, use CMAC funding to as part of the vehicle project, but the but in no case can we pay more than 100% of the incentive amount of the incremental cost amount. I'm sorry. Um, so let's go back to our example again. The diesel bus costs 100,000. The um, uh, plug-in hybrid costs 200,000 dollars. So you have a hundred thousand dollar incremental cost. Let's use the class six example. You get $70,000 from us. You can use your own stream of CMAC funding to cover the other $30,000 to bring you up to 100% of the incremental cost, but uh, you can't use more than that 30,000. In other words, if you want to use $40,000 of CMAC funding, the VW incentive map would go down by 10,000 to keep you at a no higher than 100% of the incremental cost incentive um, uh, to bring you up to no more than 100% of the incremental cost uh, of the vehicle. Okay, thank you again, Patrick, for taking the time to answer all those questions. And now we're ready to move on to the next section. Sure, and there will be, again, time to ask more questions at the end. So if you feel like you didn't get your question fully answered or you have additional questions at the end, we'll be taking additional questions. Thank you. And this is this is Ben Mandel again. I'll just uh, add on to that last explanation that Patrick gave to, to make the point that relative to combining VW and CMAC funding, if you have a voucher project that's, uh, that meets eligibility guidelines for both funding sources, um, this is where Patrick's <clears throat> note earlier about you won't, you won't really need to know or be concerned with which funding source you're drawing down from. Um, if your project is eligible for both, then the voucher amount it'll be eligible for will be the same. It's just a question of how NYSERDA divides up funding between CMAC and VW on the back end. So hopefully that, that gets to the root of that question. Okay, so now we'd like to move on and discuss a little bit more about program eligibility and making sure you have what you need to know going in uh, from a variety of perspectives for vehicle manufacturers and dealers, as well as fleets who are the end users of these, uh, these vehicles. So starting there, um, this is intended as a very accessible program that has funding available to benefit commercial, nonprofit, or public sector fleets with the exclusion of federal government fleets, and that's because that part uh, part of the program funding uh, does derive uh, originally from the Federal Highway Administration. So federal funding can't be used to benefit federal fleets. 
So some examples of the types of um, vocations or specializations of fleets that would seek funding through this program include transit bus operators, school bus operators, parcel delivery fleets, yard tractor operators, uh, and that is just a sampling. Um, not sure if Patrick mentioned up top, but when, when we refer to local freight uh, or local freight trucks in the context of this program, that really refers to any use that doesn't transport people. So there is a bus, there are categories for bus funding and there are categories for truck and truck also can on a case by case basis include specialized equipment. Of course, no single fleet can kind of dominate or monopolize the available funding. So a single fleet is limited to 25% of benefit from the total available funding at a given point in time. NYSERDA also wants to achieve durable emissions reductions and air quality improvement. So it's important to specify and participants uh, are bound to agree to <clears throat> um, operating vehicles purchased or leased through the program for a minimum of five years. There's also a reporting element. Uh, Patrick mentioned up top that the, the funding agencies administering both CMAC and VW want to know what their their funding is going to support and what the ultimate impact is. So we will be administering semi-annual fleet usage reports as we have in the past for this program uh, and fleets are required to uh, assist us in completing those reports for a minimum of three years following voucher payment. Now in the past that process of the fleet usage reporting has been done through uh, sort of a, a manual online survey process relying on fleet operators to report. The program is currently investigating the, the feasibility of a telematic solution that would be uh, most likely paid for at the, at the program's cost, uh, and it would install instrumentation onboard voucher-funded vehicles to automate a lot of the data that we would need to collect to comply with the terms of the funding of the program. Um, so more on that will be will be shared and the implementation manual will be updated accordingly as as further decisions are made now lease vehicles uh, of course are eligible to receive funding through the program it's important to point out however that the lease term just like if it were a purchase vehicle must be for at least five years and the configuration is a little different for for a lease so the leasing company is then listed as the purchaser of record and that is who ultimately is responsible for the vehicle end user requirements. So ensuring compliance with reporting, for instance, even if ultimately there is a different vehicle operator, the lessee, the leasing company is who the program will go to first uh, as the first point of defense and responsibility for making sure that the program has fleet data that it needs to satisfy reporting. Now, in terms of the vehicle technologies eligible through this program, uh, we've already largely covered this, but broadly it's weight classes three through eight or anything over 10,000 pounds uh, from a variety of fuel types, ranging from battery electric, plug-in hybrid electric, conventional hybrid, compressed natural gas and propane or liquefied petroleum gas, LPG. Um, importantly, for natural gas and propane engines, uh, seeking funding through this program, in order for those technologies to be eligible to receive funding, those engines must uh, comply with the 0.02 grams per brake horsepower hour low NOx standard that the California Air Resources Board has set up. And uh, manufacturers requesting eligible technologies in these fields need to submit documentation that those engines have been certified to meet or exceed those standards. As Patrick had mentioned, repowered vehicles are eligible through this program. Uh, they're eligible currently for only CMAC funding, meaning that they can be class three through eight battery electric technologies operating within one of the 30 CMAC uh, counties, which are, again, those that are in non-attainment with federal air, uh, ambient air quality standards or recently in non-attainment. And we want to make sure that if you're repowering a vehicle, that the vehicle has plenty of useful life remaining. So the vehicle must be certified uh, by the operator to have an operational lifespan of a minimum of 10 years going forward from the time of voucher payment. 
Scrappage is also a little bit different for repower, so I want to spend just a beat on that. Um, whereas with replacement vehicles, where you're scrapping an entire vehicle and replacing it with a new purchase, you need to scrap a diesel vehicle age 2009 or older. It's a bit different in the case of repowers, where you don't need to destroy the entire chassis. You do need to um, scrap the diesel engine, but that diesel engine needs to, needs to be six years old uh, or older. Uh, and that is intended to make sure that you still have some useful years remaining in the vehicle's life. Uh, so we can clarify that and, and take additional questions at the end if there is interest. So some additional uh, requirements to make vehicles eligible, and this is, this is a requirement that largely goes on to manufacturers, and in some cases, their authorized representatives, perhaps dealers. Uh, we need to make sure that the engine, the drivetrain, the battery packs are all under a manufacturer-supported warranty for 36 months or 50,000 miles, uh, whichever comes first. So we're asking manufacturers to submit documentation of warranty provisions so that the help center can make sure that those requirements are met. Similarly, when submitting for vehicle eligibility, the manufacturer uh, which might be an original equipment manufacturer, it might be an upfitter, which is uh, an aftermarket modifier that has uh, the original equipment manufacturer's warranty, or their authorized representative like a dealer, needs to also submit a plan to provide warranty service replacement parts and technical support in New York State, or in some cases, uh, if not tenable to do it in New York State, to provide documentation of a plan to support those vehicles uh, in the region and nearby. The point here being that if you're going to make eligible vehicle sales through this program, we need to be sure that fleets investing in those technologies will not be stranded and will be supported um, with warranty and after sales provisions. In terms of the emissions characteristics of the vehicle, uh, because a lot of the reporting is contingent on our understanding of, of the technologies when they come in to be approved by the program, uh, including emissions levels that have been certified, we're specifying that you can't add anything to the vehicle, whether that's in the form of an emissions retrofit, uh, other hardware or software, um, like a defeat device or something of that sort, for at least five years after voucher payment. We wanna make sure that the emissions characteristics that we have on record for that vehicle are going to be realized um, more or less in the field. The one notable exception here is the use of fuel-fired heaters, which are very frequently used, especially in the, in the cold New York climate in transit or school buses. So as long as they're paired with uh, use in, a, in an otherwise fully battery electric vehicle, uh, the program does permit fuel-fired heaters to be used with those technologies. So having covered a bit more on eligibility, uh, and again, we'll have time at the end to discuss questions folks might have on that portion, we now wanna spend a bit of time going through the actual process and mechanics associated with the voucher program uh, at a high level, and then the actual process of applying for, for voucher funding on a project-by-project -project basis. So first, I think it's helpful to document, you know, who are the involved parties in these transactions uh, and in this program as a whole. So first and foremost, there's the manufacturers, um, and this this sort of chain of events is playing out in real time right now, where manufacturers are submitting documentation to the program for review to get eligible vehicles listed on the website to receive funding through the program. So this can come from an original equipment manufacturer an upfit or retrofit manufacturer, um, or a company that just produces an engine or powertrain, uh, like a Cummins natural gas engine or Roush, Roush propane engine, and then puts those into vehicles that are ultimately sold uh, to customers and want that, uh, that product to be able to be sold through the program. So we ask that manufacturers or their authorized representatives submit a vehicle eligibility application as well as all supporting documentation to the Voucher Help Center. Uh, and Jenea will describe more about the mechanics of how to do that in just a few slides. The vehicle eligibility application is available for download in several places on the program website. Uh, and the, the form that you can download, which is a macro enabled Excel file, 
contains a checklist with all of the other documentation that you need to submit as a package. So after manufacturers, um, so if a manufacturer lists their vehicle for eligibility and it's approved by NYSERDA, then their authorized dealers, which we refer to as contractors in the program because ultimately that is who receives payment from NYSERDA, those dealers need to request eligibility to participate in the program, to market those vehicles to customers through the program, and ultimately to apply for voucher funding uh, to NYSERDA. So dealers or vendors that market and, and sell approved vehicle technologies um, can apply to become a contractor to NYSERDA, and that is an online application available on the website. Once that contractor is approved, meaning they've met the requirements of contractors in the program and completed a, a contractor participation agreement, they are then eligible to market the vehicles they're authorized to sell by the manufacturer through this program, and then to actually submit voucher applications once they have sales lined up. Importantly, it's the contractor who is ultimately responsible not only for submitting the voucher applications, but then providing all supporting documentation to the voucher help center as time goes on, uh, even after the voucher application has been preliminarily approved, working with the fleet, the end use fleet customer to document vehicle delivery, el eligible scrappage to correspond, um, vehicle registration and all other points of documentation needed to complete the voucher transaction. Finally, there's of course the vehicle fleets. So as mentioned, this can be commercial, nonprofit, or non-federal government public sector fleets uh, that use the point of sale discount to access uh, new battery electric or alternative fuel vehicle technologies through either purchases or leases. Now it is, is the fleet's responsibility to scrap an eligible diesel vehicle. So the contractor needs to work with fleets to make sure they're satisfying all eligibility requirements, including having uh, an appropriate diesel vehicle available to scrap. Uh, we'll go through what the scrappage consists of more in a moment. Again, it's the fleet that needs to work with the contractor to make sure the contractor has all of the information on the new vehicle, um, as well as the vehicle that's being uh, retired through scrappage so that the contractor can input that information during the vehicle, uh, the voucher application, and then redemption processes. And finally, vehicle fleets are responsible for complying with the semi-annual fleet usage reporting requirement, which historically has been a survey instrument and may or may not going forward be collected through an automated telematics approach. So in terms of sequencing this program at a glance, the first step is for manufacturers to apply to get their vehicle models that they believe meet the eligibility criteria of the program, to get their vehicle models listed for eligibility uh, on the program website. Once the vehicle model is approved as eligible, their authorized dealers, which in some cases is going to be the manufacturer itself that sells directly to customers, in other cases it will be uh, a vehicle vendor, will apply to be approved as a contractor by NYSERDA, which then authorizes them to be a voucher recipient and to make the voucher request on behalf of their fleets. Then a fleet can initiate a vehicle purchase from an eligible contractor for an eligible vehicle and designate which old vehicle, so 2009 or older diesel, will be designated for scrappage. At that point, the contractor submits the voucher application and all supporting documentation to NYSERDA via the Voucher Help Center. And NYSERDA will communicate with the contractor uh, once they know whether or not the voucher application has met all requirements. If it has voucher funding in the amount determined through the, the incremental cost assessment that Patrick outlined earlier, that voucher funding is set aside. So whether that's 90 or 95% of the incremental cost, that amount will be set aside and then the contractor is responsible for tracking delivery, scrappage of the old vehicle, and all other supporting documentation, inputting it into the voucher system, and following that through to completion to trigger voucher redemption, at which point NYSERDA will issue a check to the contractor. But again, it's important to recognize that the voucher amount needs to be deducted off the top so that it can be uh, truly a point of sale 
purchase incentive for the customer. And then the contractor is made whole once the vehicle, uh, the new vehicle is delivered, the old vehicle is scrapped, and the purchase is complete. So now drilling down a little bit into the voucher application itself. So this would have been step four in the previous graphic. Uh, first, the fleet initiates the purchase from the contractor. Potentially the contractor is, is approaching a fleet, but either way, they're trying to identify a fit and that the fleet is able to comply with the eligibility requirements of the program, uh, meaning they're an eligible fleet, um, i.e. not a federal government fleet and that they have a vehicle within basically the same use pattern. So uh, if you're seeking funding for a new transit bus, um, the contractor should make sure that you have an old transit bus that's at a similar weight, uh, weight classification um, that has a diesel engine 2009 or older available to be scrapped. Once all of that information is confirmed on the front end, the contractor then submits the voucher application including purchaser terms and conditions. So this is uh, another instance in which the contractor is a conduit for the end use uh, fleet. Once the contractor submits the voucher application, NYSERDA works with the help center to review the voucher application for accuracy and completeness. Uh, if it is not satisfactory, the help center will communicate directly with the contractor as the applicant and let them know what they need to revise or, or provide additionally. Uh, and once everything is in place to a satisfactory degree, at that point, NYSERDA reserves the appropriate voucher amount. It can then take some time, and we'll talk about timelines as well. The contractor, once a voucher is approved, has a full year to complete the redemption of the voucher, basically to cash in the voucher in the amount that's been reserved for them. So they need to document that there is final sale uh, that's taken place, the end use fleet has taken delivery of the new vehicle and that the fleet has in fact completed uh, eligible scrappage of the corresponding old vehicle. Uh, as a guideline, we're saying that the, the end use fleet has 21 days from the time they receive uh, the new vehicle to complete the scrappage. And we will be providing an eligible list of scrap facilities throughout the state as a resource uh, to help fleets better comply more easily with this requirement. NYSERDA will then review all of the redemption materials once the scrappage is done and the new vehicle has been delivered and will issue payment, assuming everything is in order. And that payment, again, goes to the contractor, not to the fleet. So now to speak a little bit more about scrappage itself. Uh, here again, the goal, and this is introduced by the, the fact that the program is now supported in large part through funding from the state's Volkswagen settlement. The goal is to reduce diesel exhaust emissions by replacing early, uh, older, dirtier diesel vehicles and engines with new all electric or alternative fueled vehicles and engines that have lower, lo uh, lower levels of NOx emissions. So eligible vehicles to be scrapped in exchange for new voucher funded vehicles include those with uh, model years uh, of diesel engines between 1992 and 2009. The vocation or use and the, the gross vehicle weight rating must be similar to the new vehicle. So if you're looking for um, funding for a class six box truck, NYSERT is going to want to see that you are scrapping an old box truck in class ideally class six, but perhaps class five or perhaps class seven. So there can be an allowance uh, for one weight rating classification in either direction. We're also going to want to see that the fuel capacity of the old vehicle must be no smaller than the new vehicle you're getting to replace it. So if you're, this, this is really only applicable in the case of a combustion technology but if you're getting a new natural gas or propane engine, or perhaps a hybrid, we're just gonna to wanna to make sure that you're not actually upsizing the combustion component relative to the, the diesel vehicle that's being retired. Now it's been discussed already, but I wanna emphasize that there is an exception here. So transit fleets operating transit buses uh, in the public interest do have the opportunity uh, if they're in a CMAC county to opt to only receive CMAC funding and not VW funding, 
and they will not have to scrap a bus. But again, this requirement or this exception is only in place for transit buses and transit eligible transit fleets, uh, such as by operated by municipalities um, in those CMAC funded, CMAC eligible counties. Now, in terms of what we mean when we say, what does eligible scrappage consist of? Scrap facilities will be very aware of these requirements, but in essence, there's an engine component and then a chassis component. So scrappage means rendering the vehicle inoperable and available for recycling of the component parts by at a minimum cutting a three inch hole in diameter within the engine block and disabling the chassis by completely cutting the frame rails in half. Uh, there is a protocol in place that will be, uh, that is contained in the program implementation manual and will be communicated to contractors and purchasers for the photo documentation required uh, before as well as after a scrappage is done. So we can make sure that the vehicle that was designated in the voucher application to be scrapped is in fact the one that ends up in the scrap yard. There's also a DEC vehicle scrappage certification, which has required elements for the scrap yard as well as the uh, end use uh, customer that has designated the vehicle for scrappage. That needs to be submitted by the contractor as part of the redemption process so that they can get paid by NYSERDA. So in terms of program timelines, um, this is kind of on an overall basis. Again, we wanna emphasize that this program as of late September is now again live. The funding is available. Um, we're still in the process of onboarding eligible vehicles and the dealers who will be authorized as NYSERDA contractors to sell those vehicles through the program and to collect voucher uh, payments. Once we have those pieces in place, and I encourage folks to check the, the NYSERDA website regularly for this purpose, we will be able to um, field voucher application submissions. Uh, and there is no application deadline. That goes for vehicle, app vehicle eligibility applications as well as voucher applications themselves. Applications for funding will be reviewed on a rolling basis until all of the funds have been allocated um, and it's first come, first served. As mentioned, applicants have 12 months from the date of preliminary voucher approval to redeem the voucher. However, recognizing that in some cases we're dealing with manufacturers that have uh, pretty significantly constrained production capacity, applicants also have the opportunity to petition the program for a six month extension beyond the 12 month period at any point during those 12 months. And that allows a total potential duration of 18 months to redeem a voucher once it's been approved. Now, along with that petition to extend uh, the redemption timeline, the program is going to wanna to see some documentation uh, from the vehicle producer, perhaps via the contractor, such as a line setting ticket uh, to document that there is in fact a plan in place to produce the vehicle that's been uh, designated for purchase. And we can have a reasonable expectation of when that truck or bus will be produced and then delivered to the fleet. One item that's not on this slide, but I do wanna emphasize again, relates to the scrappage timeline. So once a vehicle is, is delivered and a fleet takes delivery of that new uh, battery electric or alternative fuel truck or bus, that fleet will have 18 days, uh, I'm sorry, 21 days to complete an eligible sc scrappage of the corresponding old vehicle, uh, the diesel vehicle that had been identified in the voucher application. And we'll be providing more resources to help contractors and fleets uh, connect with the resources to make that very easy and doable in a timely manner. So with that, I wanna turn it over to Janea Shagog from the Center for Sustainable Energy. And Janea is going to go through a bit more about uh, the role and mechanics of the Voucher Help Center. Thanks, Ben. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Again, my name is Janea Shagog. Janae, I think we may have lost you. Your audio cut out at an unfortunate time. Are you able to hear us?
All right, I'm not sure if um, if Rachel Zook is on and able to give this part of it. Hello, yes, I am on. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Rachel. Okay, so I can quickly run through this. Um, thank you, Ben. So uh, as Janae was saying, we are with the Center for Sustainable Energy and we are operating the Voucher Help Center. We are here to answer your questions and help guide you through the vehicle contractor and voucher application processes. So if you have any questions about just general program requirements, how to navigate the website, where to find the applications, um, vehicle eligibility, submitting applications or acquired documents, don't hesitate to reach out to us by phone or email. Um, and you can see our phone number and email address listed here. We respond to emails within one business day. If we happen to miss your call, we'll return your voicemail within one business day as well. The Help Center is open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern, so hopefully that's a pretty big window for you to catch us. And we're very excited to work with you on your applications. Great. <clears throat> Thanks so much for jumping in, Rachel. Appreciate it. And so, um, you know, a lot of folks certainly have have worked with with CalStart and I sort of directly in the past uh, for inquiries related to the voucher program. So we just want to introduce CSE as as a new uh, addition to the program. And in fact, in many cases, they're going to be your your you know first place to go with questions related to mechanics. Um, they will take in vehicle eligibility requests and they are who is processing on the back end voucher requests as they come in. So we're happy to have them involved. <clears throat> okay, Susan, let's let's see if we can get this to work <clears throat> and, and have you go through the, the companion program for New York City. Um, thanks, Ben. Can you hear me? Ben? We can. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Thought we were going to have a repeat performance from the last time. Sorry. Um, so anyway, thank you very much for inviting me to to say a few words about the New York City Clean Truck Program on your webinar. Um, as Ben mentioned, um, this program is a companion program to the New York State Truck Voucher Program. It builds on the success of the Hunts Point Clean Truck Program which um, was targeted uh, at that community in the South Bronx, which has a very high concentration of truck traffic in and out of the peninsula due to uh, all of the food distribution center, meat market, et cetera, that are located there. And um, when uh, VW Money came along, we uh, made the pitch to, to the state that we would um, include that money to continue the program and also using that fund, the VW funding, expand that program to industrial business zones citywide. So as, uh, as Ben and Patrick alluded to, it is a pot of funding that is spe specifically for uh, the fleets and industrial areas in New York City. Um, we are in the process of working out our final contractual arrangements with the New York State DEC, and we hope to be announcing uh, the opening of the program in the very near future. So if you have any questions, feel free to um, call the number below or email the team at nycctp at tetratech.com. And, um, and of course, you can reach out to me as well. Um, I think that's it. Thank you, Susan. Great to, to get you speaking about this great program. Looking forward to seeing more about it. Thanks. So we're going to um, we're going to take more questions in just a moment. But before we do that, uh, I want to encourage folks to reach out to us with any questions, as well as to again bookmark and constantly refer to uh, the program website. Um, it's it's a great resource. It has all of the links you will need. So whether that's the vehicle eligibility application with instructions on how to complete it, of course, the program implementation manual, um, the, the online portal where uh, dealers that would like to request contractor status can actually petition NYSERDA to be registered in the program uh, to receive voucher funding and submit voucher requests. And this will be as well where we have the eligible vehicles list posted so that interested vehicle fleets um, 
uh, in the not too distant future, we'll be able to see what technologies they can actually purchase or lease through this program. So it is a resource, but if any of us from the NYSERDA or Help Center slash CSE or CalStart side can be of assistance throughout the process, that's what we're here for. So uh, please take down our, our contact information and it'll be available to you through the duration of the program. Okay, so uh, Karino, should we check in to see what other questions have come in? Yes, we have a few questions that came in. Uh, the first one is from James, and this is regarding the application process. So if a manufacturer sells directly to fleets, does the manufacturer need to submit the contractor and voucher applications? Yes. So if the, <clears throat> a contractor or a dealer can be either the OEM that's selling directly to the fleet um, or it can be a dealer, a dealership for the vehicle manufacturer, or it could be, you know, the final upfit manufacturer. So an entity that buys a chassis from Ford and turns it into an electric box truck. In that case, they would be the dealer. But in the in the case they were just asking about, um, the OEM can be a dealer as well. They would need to submit a contractor application to be onboarded into the program, and they would also be the ones that are submitting the voucher applications themselves. Okay, thanks, Patrick. And we have a question from Renee about outreach. So beyond this webinar and information on the site, what other forms of outreach are underway to ensure that contractors are aware of this voucher incentive program and are applying to be recognized as authorized voucher recipients? Do you want to handle that one, Ben, or well, you know. Sure. So, yeah, Renee, uh, CalStart is under contract to NYSERDA to, to take the lead on outreach, but um, that needs to be done in partnership with, with a bunch of other organizations and outreach um, channels. So, um, you know, as the program is, is getting back up and running, uh, the webinar series and, and making sure that this is recordable, uh, recorded and accessible to a wide audience is uh, kind of the first and foremost uh, mechanism. Beyond that, we're going to be seeking opportunities statewide to be partnering with uh, clean cities groups uh, and community-based organizations as well uh, to make sure that this information uh, is, is understood and, and is getting out there in front of those who are in a position to take advantage of it. Uh, so I think in the, in the history of the program, a lot of a lot, but not all of the um, activity was centered downstate uh, in and around New York City, and that's probably where the bulk of contractor activity has been so far. Um, but it's important to recognize, actually, to the to the last question, many manufacturers are engaged in in direct sales to customers. Um, and are promoting these incentives statewide. So uh, we want to be sure that we're engaging with the proper groups who are working with fleets interested in learning more about available incentives that can help them acquire cleaner technologies, um, as well as dealers in a position to maybe help us scale up a little bit and, and reach a broader audience through their sales channels throughout the state. So uh, we're certainly open to suggestions as we put together that outreach program. Thanks, Ben. And now we have a question regarding scrappage. So if a fleet wants to replace a leased di diesel vehicle with a new leased battery electric vehicle, how do they meet the scrappage requir requirement? Uh, they can, <clears throat> in the case of leases uh, particularly, if the, um, the leasing entity has another vehicle that meets the scrappage requirements that is registered in New York for the previous two years, um, they can scrap that vehicle. The leasing company can scrap a vehicle on behalf of the end use fleet. So if you are leasing a fleet that leases vehicles, the entity that is leasing the vehicle to the fleet can scrap a vehicle on their behalf as long as it meets the other scrappage requirements. 
Thanks, Patrick. And we have one more question regarding scrappage from Renee. Um, so what practices are employed to safeguard against negative downstream waste impacts? Is NYSERDA involved in any monitoring of scrappage best practices? That's a good detailed question. Um, I think once once the vehicles have reached the scrapyard facility itself, um, we you know the uh, the requirements of the program, or the, and the vehicle is officially scrapped um, per the program rules. Um, that is something that we would be interested in looking at at the, with the scrapyards to see where that those materials end up uh, after they're scrapped. So that is a good and interesting question for us, um, and we'll certainly do some more research on that to get to get a more fuller answer. But. And I'll, I'll add that auditing is, is a component of the scrappage program, um, which we'll be helping NYSERDA with. Uh, so we're not able to be present to attend every scrappage event throughout the state, but we will want to make sure that the scrap yards are complying with, with DEC's guidance for what a scrappage, uh, you know, an eligible scrappage looks like and consists of. Um, I, I know I would, for one, be interested in incorporating elements of, you know, where do these materials go from here um, in an audit survey that we could conduct with scrappage facilities that are participating in the program? Okay, thank you, Renee, for raising that point. And now we have a few questions regarding funding. Uh, the first is from Paul. So the charts you show indicate that only class three trucks are CMAC eligible, while class four and higher are VW eligible. How then could VW and CMAC funds be combined to reach 100% of the incremental cost? Specifically for a class three truck, they could not. Um, again, the, the, the entire VW settlement won't um, provide an incentive for anything smaller than a class four uh, truck or bus throughout the entire VW settlement program. Uh, under the CMAC, we can go down to a class three, but it's strictly for a battery electric trucks and buses only, and strictly for the 30 counties uh, that are CMAC eligible. Okay, and has it been specified if yard trucks will fall into the $150,000 class seven category or the $185,000 class eight category? Currently, yard trucks are only eligible under the CMAC portion. So for a Class 7 uh, yard truck, it would be $120,000 for um, an electric yard truck. The VW settlement does include funding specifically for port and drainage um, handling equipment, which probably would have a higher incentive, but less total funding. So um, we are in negotiations with DEC to add a specific funding line for, again, for electric and uh, port drainage trucks and cargo handling trucks. Um, that probably won't occur until like sometime in the first quarter of 2020. And those incentive amounts may, may be higher than what we currently have available under CMAC, may be higher. Okay, and we have a question now regarding eligibility. Can a manufacturer work to get a technology approved for funding that is currently not listed on the approved list of technologies? Um, and this question is being asked by an OEM of battery electric idle reduction equipment. Uh, no, it would have to meet one of those um, five criteria. It has to be a, a full battery electric vehicle, a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, conventional hybrid, strictly powered by compressed natural gas, or strictly powered by propane. Uh, so we don't currently allow uh, like electric power takeoffs or anti-idling technologies. Um, the programs are strictly focused on drivetrain technologies themselves. Um, if you have a specific inquiry, be, you know, feel free to send us in some information uh, to double check that it qualifies or not. Thanks, Patrick. And now we have a question regarding uh, partial funding. Are there any partial funds available for meeting some of the requirements, or is this an all or nothing approval process? It's an all or nothing approval process. Okay, and now this is a question regarding uh, the Hunts Point program. What areas in New York City will the DOT expand 
the height the hunt point program too. Hopefully, Susan. I don't know if you're able oh, to you. take that at this point. Yeah. Um, well, so our our um, we did expand our uh, current program management contract to include industrial business zones throughout the city. So um, that list you can find at New York City Economic Development Corporation. They actually are the caretakers of the of the property. Uh, of those properties, I should say, they're, they are located throughout um, the city of New York, and we would be looking to, you know, once our, once everything would be in place, that we would uh, try to reach out to uh, those IBZs that, uh, you know, also have um, freight-related air quality impacts for the most part. Thank you, Susan. And we have a question regarding scrappage. Um, so who is responsible for scrapping the vehicles? Is it the contractor or the fleet? The fleet is responsible for uh, scrapping the vehicle, but we cannot make a payment to the contractor unless that vehicle is scrapped. So our suggestions to the contractors are that they include whatever um, wording in their contracts necessary to ensure that the fleet, end use fleet does scrap the vehicle. Um, I think both the fleets and the contractors need to keep in mind is NYSERDA is essentially making a payment to the contractor on behalf of the end use fleet that's buying the truck or the bus. If the if the fleet does not do does not satisfy the requirements of the program, we cannot pay the contractor, and the fleet is still on the hook for making final payment of the vehicle to the contractor or the dealer that is selling the truck or bus. Thank you. And now we have a question from Henry. Uh, when will the VW settlement program funding be available? And I'm going to assume since uh, you know the program has launched that this is in relation to transit buses. Uh, we're hoping to have the, the transit funding and the school bus funding available in the program by the end of the year, um, probably no later than January of 2020, it should be available. And again, that's for the addition of the the transit bus funding and the school bus funding. Okay, thank you. And we have another question about yard trucks. Um, for yard trucks that are only eligible for CMAS funding, can a fleet use up to 25% of the 10 million of CMAS funding or 25% of the total $18.4 million available? It'd be 25% of the funding that they would be eligible for is the max they can get. So currently under the program, it's only eligible for uh, yard hostlers or electric yard hostlers are only eligible under the CMAC portion of the program. Uh, so they would be capped at the two and a half million dollars. And that's by, that's by fleet, that's not by manufacturer. So those caps are by, uh, you know, like a specific county you can't get more than two and a half million dollars for yard hostlers. Uh, it's not by manufacturer. Thanks, Patrick. Now we have a question for Susan. Does the Hunts Point program have separate requirements regarding vehicle eligibility, or does it mirror one of the two programs we reviewed today? Um, because we don't have our contract uh, locked in, um, I'm a little bit uh, reluctant to go into a lot of detail. Um, but I would say that we, you know, NYSERDA, the, the NYSERDA voucher uh, dollar amounts and things of that nature would be sort of the the overriding um, amounts that we would be able to fund. We're not, we will not be able to, you know, offer, say, like a different scenario. Um, but um, as for eligibility, there's there will be some, you know, obviously some differences just based on the prox the location of the of the fleet applying, and if that a fleet applies to the voucher program, but falls within, uh, you know, an IBZ zone, for instance, um, they would get funded probably through us. Um, I guess that's 
saying it without saying it. But, uh, but we we can't really go into you know um, full details yet. I mean, I would say look look for you know our webinar uh, emails coming up in the near future. Hopefully, once we get the uh, the contract uh, locked in, and we will be um, you know setting up the these sort of same informational webinars as well and have been on so that we can go through, you know, some of those finer points. Thank you, Susan. And Patrick, the next question is for you. If a class eight battery electric vehicle costs about $300,000, then how much CMAC and BW funding would cover the initial cost? So under the program, a class eight electric truck would be eligible for the maximum incentive amount shown in the, um, in the class four to eight truck chart, which would be the $185,000. Uh, so in other words, when we're, you can, you can either get one, the, the incentive can't be any higher than the highest incentive shown for any weight class truck. What we'll do of that $185,000 is 100,000 of that might come out of CMAC and the other $85,000 may come out of VW. So when we say we're combining funds, there's still a max cap incentive that you can get. Um, it's just that the max cap incentive may be broken up into behind the scenes by NYSERDA into a portion of that might come from CMAC and a portion of it might come from uh, VW funding. I'd also just like, this is Ben, I'd just like to um, support that point by mentioning that uh, I pulled up the slide with the program sequence process and Embedded in step one, not only are we reviewing vehicle technologies to make sure they comply with program requirements, but we're also reviewing documentation of the the retail price of a new truck uh, in this case. So we would see, okay, we've got a class eight battery electric truck. It's retailing for 300,000. And then the manufacturer requesting eligibility for that model would also need to supply um, a price sheet and a documented price for a new diesel comparable truck. So a diesel class eight truck um, with you know a current or very recent model year. And entailed in reviewing that eligibility application, that's when NYSERDA will determine what the applicable voucher amount is subject to that funding table. So if we see that the difference in cost is 100,000, then that uh, that truck in class eight would be eligible for 95% or $95,000, which is well below the $185,000 cap. But I just wanted to make the point that within step one is where the voucher amount applicable to a particular vehicle is determined. Thank you, Ben. And now we have a question about scrappage uh, from Brett and this one he, he wants to ask the question verbally, so I'm going to unmute you now, Brett, and you can go ahead and ask your question. Great, thank you very much. Hey, first of all, uh, Ben, Patrick, great job, appreciate it all. Um, as it relates to scrappage, just uh, one thing that was, I think, worthy discussion. Um, in other markets, there's been issues with um, scrappage, you know, taking a long time, nine, 12 months even, and to get documentation and go through all the processes and those things um, created huge problems for you know both manufacturers, dealers, and users. Um, it's great that you have a list of, of maybe preferred uh, scrappage folks that you're going to provide, but is there any fences around uh, requirements, uh, you know, service level agreements, timeframes on their end to ensure that this happens in a timely manner and all the documentation gets, you know, uh, moved forward uh, appropriately. Yeah, we're we're there's there's several answers to that. So the first is in the terms and conditions document that a fleet has to sign, it makes this explicitly clear to them that we are making again making a payment to the vehicle dealer on their behalf, and that if they don't pay, if they don't. Uh, you know, scrap the vehicle in a timely manner and they don't do the things that are necessary to the program, they still owe that manufacturer or that vehicle dealer the incentive money. We, we won't be able to make the payment on their behalf. Second, we're, we're going out and pre-approving and, and uh, reviewing scrappage facilities around the state trying to streamline that process um, as absolutely best that we can. And we're also providing a lot of hand-holding through our help center and through CalSTART and again through even NYSERDA 
to help these fleets understand what the requirements are and to you know to hold their hands through the process so that they are submitting all of the correct documentation. Um, as part of the process that we or documentation and other things that we have available, when uh, the vehicle dealer can download a list of all the documents that they need and all the information that they need from the fleet uh, prior to even applying for their vehicle uh, voucher application. And we also have documentation that shows everything that you're going to need from that fleet as part of the voucher redemption process. So you know, our suggestion is to give that to the fleet as early in the process as possible and start collecting that information um, as much as they can up front and letting that fleet know that they do have to make that scrappage um, within three weeks of the uh, of the vehicle being delivered. That's a requirement on them as part of the program. And again, we, we, we put all these requirements very explicitly in a terms and conditions document that the fleet has to sign as part of the voucher application process. So it's it's told to them up front and it's very well explained to them up front their requirements under the program. So hopefully we can mitigate those issues as, as, as much as possible. Right, and all that's great, and that's not really the issue. It's just once it's out of your hands into the scrapyard, um, getting that final documentation has been taken care of. Having them have a sense of urgency or responsibility to get what's required to ensure final payments where the issue is. Yeah, we'll be training the scrapyards as well, exactly what we need from them. And there's a, it's a certification document that they'll, that they'll sign along with some pictures of the scrappage itself um, that can be submitted um, back to us as well. So, you know, we're going to be training the scrapyards on how to do this. And, you know, you may, on, your, on the manufacturer side or the dealer side, you may want to, may want to say to them, you, if you want me to deliver the vehicle to you, you need to go scrap your vehicle. Show me the scrappage documentation, and then I'll deliver your vehicle to you. Um, you know, and or other things like that. And keep that in mind as you're as you're writing your purchase contract with the end use fleet. To keep in mind that they do need to submit this documentation to you in a, in a timely manner. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Before we get to a few more questions, I just want to take this time to mention that if anybody else would like to ask a question to Patrick, um, not typing it, but verbally asking, you can take this time to raise your hand. And once we get through these last two questions, we'll be able to unmute you. So we have a question from Alan. Will the website have a table that lists the incentive amounts for each individual vehicle? Yes, it will. Uh, we've already submitted that for vehicles that have been approved. Um, it's in our IT department's queue to be posted on the website. Um, unfortunately, I don't have control over how quickly they do that, um, but it will be updated as additional vehicles um, are approved under the program. We will we, we'll be posting them directly on the website. Perfect. And Susan, this next question is for you. Will the Hunts Point program apply to trucks only or to school buses and transit buses as well? Uh, thanks for the question. That's a good one. We are uh, only funded uh, or will be um, looking for funding for um, mitigate, mitigation action items one and six in the, in the uh, beneficiary plan, which is uh, freight only. Freight and port drayage. So any any class four through eight that does not is not a people mover. Transit would be out. And school buses right. would be out as well. Right. And currently currently the school buses are the all electric school buses are currently eligible under the program as we have it today. Um, and the program the additional VW funding that we're adding to the program going forward, New York City uh, fleets would be eligible under that funding as well. So we, we are covering that for the city. Thank you both for clarifying. Um, and that brings us to the end of our questions. And at this time, I don't see anyone else's hand raised. I do see one more question that I just want, I want to pose to Patrick that, that came in a little bit earlier, uh, relates to Buy America requirements and whether those apply to the, the VW funds available for trucks. The, the Buy America requirements apply to every vehicle that is applying to the program for funding. Uh, so it's an across the board requirement. Um, 
And again, part of the reason for that is we're trying to, to meld the two different funding sources together into one program. And we also, in many occasions, may need to use partial funding from one funding from both funding sources to fund a specific vehicle project. And uh, to do that, we need to make sure that both the program funding source requirements are met under all vehicles in the program. So people can think of, of this Buy America requirement across the board as fundamentally similar to how the scrappage requirement from VW funding is being applied similarly across the board, including to CMAC only projects with the transit exception that's been noted. Correct. Okay, well, I don't believe additional questions have come in. And we're right at 2.30. Um, oh, we got another question because I said that. <laughs> <laughs> and the question is, what is the chance that the Buy America requirement is removed? Um, I, I can weigh in on this first, and then, and then Patrick, if, if you want, you can follow up. Um, I, I would say it's slim right now. So the, the Buy America waiver that the CMAC program has is a carryover from the prior iteration of the program. So it's been attached to the funding that NYSERDA is leveraging from DOT uh, for the purposes of this program. Um, but again, it's just the, the waiver allows it to be just final assembly to be documented within the US. Um, and that can take a variety of forms and, and we'll be happy to, to speak with folks on the manufacturer end, on the dealer end about you know, what could satisfy that requirement. Um, we think it's it's able to be satisfied by a wide variety of manufacturers, even those without domestic, you know, full value chain production. Correct. And I guess that that brings me to a point, which is which is that folks should view these applications whether it's for new vehicles to become eligible in the program um, or to become eligible as a contractor or even for a voucher request as, you know, not, I need to have everything perfect. Of course, we want people to have all the documentation they can and work closely with fleets um, and, and maybe upstream partners in the case of vehicle applications to have all the documentation ready, but uh, there's program staff ready and responsible for assisting you through this process. So if it would be helpful at any point to go through the vehicle eligibility application form and uh, corresponding requirements, um, or to walk through the voucher submission process. Um, on one hand, I wanna point out that we do have training modules posted live, recorded webinars from over the summer on the NYSERDA truck voucher program website to walk uh, prospective applicants through the process of submitting a voucher request. Um, but we're also available to, to discuss this process with folks uh, at really any point in time. We want to make sure that uh, all of the information is provided accurately and completely, but we're, we're cognizant that especially on the front end, uh, there are a lot of requirements in play, and that's why we wanted to have this session, so we can try to clearly communicate that to as wide an audience as, as possible. Yeah, I think I, this is Patrick. I'd just like to reinforce what Ben's saying as well, that we, we're trying to provide as many resources as possible um, to assist you in, in getting into the program and getting your vehicles approved. Um, you know, it, it's, it may seem like we're, there was a lot of roadblocks that we we're talking about, but mainly we're just throwing everything out there so that you're aware of the constraints that we're operating under. But we really do want to approve your truck or your bus. We, we really do want to get vouchers uh, active and going. We really do want to, you know, get these vehicles on the road, pay out the incentives and, and, and you know, really have a, an effect on the marketplace in New York. So we are, you know, if, even if you feel like you may not be necessarily eligible for something, give us a call, submit some documentation, start the process with us. And we're more than happy to work with you and, and uh, provide whatever assistance we can to get you through that process and get you into the program and, and get things going. All right. Well, I think that's a, that's a good place to end it. Um, 
This webinar recording will be posted on the website. Uh, it'll also be sent around in a follow-up email to anyone who, who had registered for the webinar, uh, whether or not they were able to attend, um, and then look for it to be posted to the website in the, in the coming days, as well as additional updates on vehicle eligibility, um, and hopefully getting yourself more familiar with the various components of the program and how you can participate. Uh, so I just want to thank everyone for their time and attention this afternoon. I know this is a lot of information. Feel free to reach out to NYSERDA, the Help Center, or us at CalStart with any questions about what you've heard uh, or what you didn't hear but would like to. Um, and we'll see what we can do to, to get you the resources you need. So thanks very much, everyone, and have a great afternoon. Thank you, Ben. Thank <laughs> you.